as I'm going to invite up our next speaker, Mr. Timothy Dilbert, the CEO of BMT Solutions. Now, Timothy has been in software development for more than 13 years, with seven years in his current position at BMT Solutions. During his tenure, Timothy has been fortunate enough to do software development in six different countries, working for clients in the public sector, retail, utilities, education, and financial services. Development has certainly always been something Timothy has been passionate about. And these days, he's focusing on be bridging the gap between security, infrastructure, and development by using automation and hybrid cloud. Now, when Timothy is not sitting in front of a computer, he spends time with his family, especially each weekend cooking new recipes with his four-year-old daughter, Avery. So I'm going to invite Timothy to the stage to talk about hybrid cloud, application development, and security. Okay. This is too short for me. Oops. All right. Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Okay. okay. And All the way back. Okay. Great stuff. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Timothy Dilbert. Uh, welcome to Hybrid Cloud Application Development and Security. Uh, the goal for today is to give you an introduction to what all these terms mean, and uh, hopefully with you leaving, having an understanding of how it's applicable to you and your organizations. So first of all, uh, let me start off with saying this talk is not just for the geeks. Don't laugh, these are my people. Uh, I am a geek myself, obviously not very good with a clicker. Uh, if your company leaders are in the building, but they're not in the presentation here, now's a good time to go grab them. The idea here, um, like Ms. Jane had mentioned, is to bridge the gap between the techie guys, us geeks, as well as the decision makers in your company. So if you're a business leader that's making decisions about budgets, an IT manager, that manages the team, creating a strategy for your company and a vision for the future, or a software developer doing the grunt work. Uh, the idea here is to make the things that you want your business leaders to buy for you, make them understand the technologies, make them feel good about spending the money that they need to spend for those things, and make them understand the value that these things bring to their organization. So to start off with, uh, my name is Timothy Dilbert. I am the, or I carry the title of CEO at BMT Solutions. Uh, that being said, I do get my hands dirty from day to day. I would consider myself more so than anything else a software developer. So I definitely understand the underlying technologies, the underside stacks that uh, the developers in the room use on a day to day basis. I've worked um, in, I've got to get used to this, I keep switching here and not up here. <laughs> Uh, I've worked in Canada, Cayman Islands, to name a few, uh, in industries like legal, utilities, education, gaming, and then through BMT and uh, other third parties, I've worked for companies in countries like Canada, Cayman, Bermuda, South Africa, Nigeria, and a few other ones. I went to school in Canada, Vancouver, Canada. I studied graphic design, but after a few conversations with uh, some of the professors there, they mentioned to me that software developers make more money, so that made that switch easy. Uh, at the time, my favorite platform was Adobe Flash. And uh, my favorite language was ActionScript. Not sure if you guys remember the 2000s, but just about all the great websites were built in Adobe Flash at the time. Uh, in my opinion, an absolutely brilliant, brilliant platform. I wish it had uh, stood the, the uh, test of time, but alas, it hasn't. Uh, while I was in Canada, one of the things I, one of the projects I worked on was Big Bucks Footy. 
So Big Box Footy was a fantasy football game. Uh, this was before fantasy football became as, as kind of prevalent as it is now. Uh, but you, a lot of you are probably in some sort of fantasy football league or you have uh, someone very close to you that is part of one. Back then it wasn't so prevalent. It was one of these things that just a few people, a few groups of people did. My involvement on that platform was uh, I built a UI for it. So that would allow you to kind of, Big Bucks Footy would allow you to watch the fantasy football games in real time. You can kind of see the ball being passed around between all the people. Uh, you can watch the fatigue of your players and uh, sub people in and out. And my job was to build a user interface that people used to do that sort of stuff. Uh, while I was in Canada, I also started a company called Go Rent Canada. Uh, that was me and a friend of mine, Scott. Uh, and that was a multi-listings apartment, multi-lingual apartment listings platform. So um, in Canada, uh, or in Vancouver, if you're not familiar with it, Vancouver is a very, very multicultural city. Absolutely fantastic place. If you haven't visited, I would put it on the list. Uh, it's, it's the gateway to Asia. Uh, it has, because a lot of movies are shot in Vancouver, there's a lot of innovation and technology brought up from the United States there. Uh, it has a massive Persian community. And those, in my opinion, are some of the most innovative and hardworking people I've ever come across. And with them, they bring a lot of innovation and a lot of culture from where they're from. And uh, at the, the end result of that is kind of like what you have here in Cayman. It's a very, very multicultural area. Uh, the idea behind the platform that me and Scott had was uh, we got sick of Craigslist. You, you go on there, you're looking for a place to rent. Uh, landlords speak various languages hard to find the apartment that you're looking for. So we built Go Rent Canada. What it allowed people to do is it didn't matter what language you spoke, you could go onto our platform, post a listing about a, a vacancy that you had in whatever language that you had it in, and we would automatically show that in over 14 different languages. So English, Farsi, simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, Korean, French, German, Russian, and I'm sure there's a lot of other ones that I'm missing out. On. So, there you go. This is my office. Not literally, I wish it was. I'm sure all of us do. But I am from the Cayman Islands. This is the place that I call home. Uh, Cayman is a, a fantastic place where innovation thrives. It's a, this country is constantly reinventing ourselves. We're always outdoing ourselves. And it's a place where nothing seems impossible. I consider myself very lucky, even though I'm born here, even though I've raised here, I still consider myself, as I'm sure everybody else in the room that's resident here believes, which is that uh, we're very, very fortunate to be in a country where all those things that I was saying before is genuinely the case where anything is possible. These are some of the different technologies I've worked with over the years. Uh, I've seen some familiar faces in the room. You'll probably know me from SharePoint. I've been doing that for the better part of 15 years or so. Uh, I work with these, when I work with these technologies, it's generally connecting desperate systems together, right? Or some sort of integration work. Maybe I'm connecting systems together. Maybe I'm doing document management, some analytics, pulling data from one platform to another and crunching numbers on it, automation, those sort of things. These days, I'm primarily focused on uh, products from the companies like what you see on here. If you're not seeing Microsoft, don't take that the wrong way. I've definitely it's still a lot available, a lot of uh, work in SharePoint. It's just that these are kind of the, the companies that I've been focused on lately. IBM, Red Hat OpenShift, Red Hat Ansible, and then IBM products like Mass360, Verified Guardian, Privilege Vault, things like that. I'm also familiar with tools in Cayman, like I manage Adirant um, and you know, AWS Azure, et cetera. Interestingly, I heard Wolfgang talk about this yesterday, and he was talking about uh, chaos engineering. For those of you that looked at that and you found that interesting, you should be taking a look at Ansible. Ansible, in my opinion, is a great platform to do chaos engineering. It allows you to create playbooks that you can kind of lightly break your environment, if you will. So rather than kind of going into your data center and unplugging a server and seeing if everything goes down, uh, maybe you just want to disable a NIC on your VM host. 
see if your, if your, your um, various virtual machines have failed over to the next server. And if they haven't, you can quickly re-enable it. Your downtime is only a few minutes, and you've got an opportunity to kind of speak to whoever is in charge of the resiliency of your systems. So, but we're here to talk about development. And so let's, let's get on to the topic at hand, and let's start with a very basic question. What is an application? For a lot of you, you're probably thinking, I, know, I already know what that is. It's the app on my phone that I shout at. It's the thing I complain to the help desk about. Or it's the wizard that times out right after you stepped away from your computer for a few minutes. What, what an application boils down to, however, is a key phrase that I've come up with and I've been telling myself over the years, and it's really helped kind of govern my thoughts whenever I'm thinking about how to architect something. And, and that is that an application is multiple layers of critical services packaged together and sold as a single unit. So from a technology perspective, you know, the top layer, the red part, that's going to be your UI. Then you're moving down the stack, you've got your customizations, authentication and authorization, APIs and data stores. From a business user's perspective, the top layer is your specialty. That's what your product does. Maybe you are a um, compliance engine, right? Maybe you are a grade book for a school. This could be file opening for a law firm, whatever it is that your application does. The second layer down, if you've purchased this application from a third party, that's the place where you go to make customizations to that, that out-of-box application to make it better fit your company's needs. If you're building a platform, this is the framework that you've created to allow someone else to do the same. I'm going to skip over for security for a second and move to the bottom two one. Reading and writing of information, that's your business logic. You're not developing a spreadsheet. You want your application to be smart. It needs to have validation, business logic checks. Do something to add value to whatever people are purchasing. And at the, the bottom layer is that where your data ultimately resides. Maybe your data goes into some sort of backend system. Maybe it interfaces with some third-party platform. If you're a trading, maybe it's at the end of all of this, it issues a trade on, a, on some sort of stock exchange, or maybe it just pushes it in the back-end system for you to crunch data, opens files in your file opening, your document management, whatever it is that this, this application does. Now I want to go back to that middle one that I skipped out, though. Security. It's important for the business leaders in the room to take a close look at security. Because in my opinion, this is what I think SEMO was also after when they were talking about their cybersecurity framework. Whether you, these, these are applications that you use to create offerings that you uh, put out there in the market and you sell to other people. It doesn't matter whether you've built this application or you're buying someone else's application, the security element is part of your responsibility because it is included in the service that you're offering to someone else. So business leaders that are in the room need to keep, that, need to keep conscious of that so that when you're, when you're being approached, when you're making decisions on things, that you're keeping that in the forefront of your mind. And I think that was part of what the, the whole idea was when mentioning cybersecurity. So now, that is your application stack. Let's talk about technology a little. There's two terms I want to cover that um, I think it's important to kind of go over before we go too far into this. So these, those two terms are monolithic for, and microservices. These two terms are used everywhere. Business leaders are seeing it in their proposals. Your IT managers are seeing it in the conferences that they go to and webinars they attend. Your developers are seeing it in their training session, but almost nobody knows what it means. It's not that it's complicated to understand, it's just sometimes it can be a little tricky to explain. So let's go over this, and I'm going to try my best to cover this in a way that makes sense. We'll start off with the monolithic architecture. And for business people that are in the room, I promise this is the techie part, and it will be over very soon. But it is important for you to understand this. Monolithic means that everything's self-contained. 
And this illustration is a great example of what that means, a great representation of that. Everything's together, packaged together, almost always put on a single server. Most of the software you purchased in the last 10 years will be, will be a monolithic structure. And the best indicator of this is that when you find a vendor that offers a service that you want, the first thing your vendor says is, I need a server. I want my own server so that I can put my application on this and nobody else's stuff can be on there. And at least in my experience, this is one of the number one reasons for server sprawl. You have 100 applications in your environment, you have 100 servers. There's a movement happening, however, <clears throat> to, to move away from this sort of structure and move into what's called microservices. So take a look at this, the cube. This is the same cube that was there before. It's the same application. It does all of the same things as it, as it was before. You have this, to your end users, they have the same UI, they have the same experience, the same business logic that we were talking about before is there, and data is still being written to the same data sources. But what, the, what you've done, however, is that you've taken that larger application, that single server application, and you've broken it down into smaller components. So what was now once a single application host, in a single DLL hosted on a single server, now becomes a collection of small applications, of small services, of micro services. And the reason people are doing this is that these microservices are generally hosted in something called a container. I'm not going to get into the details of what a container is here now, but at a high level, what it means is that they're getting the same isolation that your vendor wanted to begin with, that your vendor was demanding from you when they said they want their own server. You, your application is still operating within a small environment. It's isolated from everything else. <clears throat> And you get all those benefits without the overhead of another operating system, another, which also which requires endpoint detection and response agents, event management, privilege access management, your licenses fees are going up and up and up, which is where business users start caring about this. Backups, monitoring, licensing, and much more. So now what was once a cube that looked great, this is what your applications start to look like. Now, if you're not a technical person and you're looking at this, your, your, your first response is, no, thank you, I'll take the cube. It's better to understand. And if you're a developer in the room that understands microservices architecture, you're probably thinking, why couldn't I have come up with a better diagram than this? Bear with me. I'm going to answer some of those questions now. <clears throat> now, First question that is on everybody's mind, though, is why would you want a microservices architecture? We talked about the server sprawl that you get from monolithic. But in order to understand why people would want a microservices platform, let's take a look at the greatest system architect of all time, Mother Nature. Because people have a hard time conceptualizing what microservice actually means, Let's see if we can give, the, give an example of something that you can refer to every day. Tonight, look, look in the mirror. You are the oldest and most mature mi microsystem architecture ever built. The human body is a great way to understand how you could take a complex thing and break it down into a bunch of subsystems. You have a nervous system, a respiratory system, digestive, muscular. We all share this same collection of subservices. And even though we all share that, it's obvious that, this it's obvious that this architecture is very versatile and scales. That means that this doesn't just apply to the, the people that you read about, Netflix, Google, et cetera. It also applies to the applications at the scale and size that you're developing. And just like when the systems break or you need something done within one of those systems, you go see a specialist. You're seeing a doctor that specializes in your area, whatever it is, whatever subsystem is broken. 
The same applies to, to developers. By breaking your big application down into microservices, you're breaking your application up into small bits of work that you can outsource to specialists rather than try to find a generalist developer that knows absolutely everything about the product that you're trying to build. You can get a collection of small developers to build the specific components that you're trying to extend your application with. So let's go back now to the original diagram here. Just like the human body is built up is a system of microservices architecture, in this diagram, each circle represents a microservice. Each piece of functionality of your product. I was supposed to bring my little pointer here, but I didn't. So you're going to have to bear with me as I try to explain out a few things just pointing at the screen. Take a look closer at the diagram. It might have looked chaotic before, but you can still see that your idea is clearly defined. The light bulb is very visible to you. And remember that you're the most important person when it comes to whatever it is that you're trying to build. And you're looking at this and you say, well, that's great. Thank you very much for the lesson in microservices technology. Thank you very much for all of that. But this is a security conference. What does this have to do with security? And this is where business leaders can really take away some really good information. <clears throat> Each, let's focus now on, on the outer circles. Each por portion of this outer circle, uh, each one of these outer, cir out outer circles, sorry, is a piece of functionality, a new piece of functionality that you want to add to your product. Each of, each of these can be developed by, by individual developers, different companies. All of them can contribute to your overall idea, which you can snap that functionality into your application but you can also keep them locked out of the underlying code, the underlying nuts and bolts that make your unique product. Because of concurrency, things are being developed faster. And <clears throat> you can work with vendors that specialize in whatever small service that you're trying to create. And when these companies that you've outsourced to leave and they work with your competitors, they're not taking their, your idea with them because they didn't have visibility into all the different pieces of functionality inside of your application. They built you a specific thing. They built you a shareholder register management system. They built you a, an AI engine that gives you predictive analytics. They didn't get into the underlying code the core piece of your functionality, they didn't take your idea and they're not going to bring it to someone else. Now, while this is the case, you're still going to be developing on some sort of common framework, some sort of, of common set of tools. So let's zoom out a bit from your application and take a look at this more holistically. <clears throat> Most, when you, the, the application that you develop and the underlying microservices that make up your application, those are running on a common set of tools like object storage, e-signing, maybe some sort of in-memory in database, identity and access management. And rather than build all of these things yourself from scratch, you can utilize these services that are built by others. And this is where hybrid cloud starts to shine. You can go on to places like Amazon, like Azure, like IBM Cloud, and find these services for rent, if you will. The problem is, is that these are traditionally cloud-based. We all know about the environmental reasons why in Cayman, it's diff it can be difficult, cloud can sometimes be difficult. With hybrid cloud, you can pull these services, these traditionally cloud services, on-premise and run them on your infrastructure sitting in your data center or in your office. So now you've got these robust systems that previously were running in the cloud that were something that you couldn't touch. You can, do th you can pull down these services through platforms like OpenShift and run them on hardware you can look at in a jurisdiction that you feel comfortable with. 
Let's zoom out a little further. You need, you should have a multi-cloud strategy. We're getting out of the technical now and we're getting into the business side of this. Remember, security is not just about protecting a teenage kid trying to hack into your laptop or some geopolitical enemy. It's also about protecting the continuity of your business. As you heard, clouds go down. Cloud prices can change. Things can happen that affect the availability of your services. You, sh you should never and you should not be betting on a single cloud provider for those reasons. Betting on a single cloud provider is kind of like getting two internet connections into your building, but having them both come from the same internet service provider. It's just not a good idea. Remember, every, these clouds exist, and every cloud has a niche. There will always be a market for your IGA and President's Choice type of cloud providers like AWS and, and Azure. They do a little bit of everything. Uh, they have a broad product base. It's more about variety than anything else. But as, our, as we talked about, your application is cut up and, and broken up into small services. You want to be able to take some of your microservices and run them on clouds that have a specialty and a niche that you need. So if you want to do image processing, AI inferencing, predictive analytics, maybe IBM Cloud is a better fit for you. And you run that one component of your application up there. Storage, AWS, interoperability, Azure, you've got Windows, it makes a lot of sense. The idea there is that you're not beholden to anyone. And you need to make sure that the tools that you have to automate these things <clears throat> can work on every cloud provider. So going back to the original analogy of the human body being a microservices architecture, if, if the human body, if all these different subsystems are all your different microservices, Identity and access management is the heart of your platform. So what is identity and access management? Well, let's take a look at Office 365. You go to one place, you sign in once, right? And then you have access to all of these different systems and services. That's one part of, of what identity and access management gives you. You, you should be using things like OpenID, Connect, and SAML to help protect not only the applications that other people build for you, but also the applications that you build yourself. Stop using Active Directory Act, to manage your authorization and to your application. Active Directory is great for Windows, not so great for iOS and Mac. It's not compatible with a SaaS architecture. And then Sooner or later, Active Directory becomes this boneyard of groups, AD groups, that nobody knows whether they're still in use, what their original function were, and everybody's too afraid to delete them because they don't know what it's going to break. <laughs> I, could, I, I, I could see the IT guys over there. The other thing that you're going to get out of identity and access management is, not, is access management and review. So let's take a look at the at the ring here. At the top, somebody needs access to a system on your, in your computer or in your network. They call the help desk, which is the green. Help desk contacts the application owner. So let's say somebody wants access to the finance system. They speak to the finance person. Finance person says, yes, they can have access. They then help desk gives the access, and that's the end of that. Then sometime in the, past, sometime in the future, a few months later, somebody questions. You know, why, here's all these, these people that have access to all these different systems. There's an inquiry that goes into why the person was given access to it. And then the application owner is eventually contacted and, and there's some sort of determination that uh, the access is no longer required. The problems with this, this setup here is that help desk is an unnecessary middleman because all they're doing is seeking authorization from someone else. 
And what's also not covered in this is that using your current flow, which is probably Active Directory, the review part is not mandated. It's a voluntary process that you hope people go through. Let's take a look at what happens when you use an identity and access management platform. Instead of people contacting the help desk, they're going to their launch pad, and they've got a list of applications there available that they get by default. When a person, if you don't see something that you need access, but you need access to, let's say uh, DocuSign in this example, the requester s fills out our, an access request along with a justification and hits submit, and it goes to the application owner directly. That's the business use user that is in charge. So take DocuSign out of that and let's put in uh, something else. Let's say it's your register management system. Let's say it's your finance system. Let's say it's Ansible Tower, whatever it is. That application owner approves it. Help desk is no longer involved. Your paper trail is still intact and you get to the end a lot quicker. What also comes with this is that you've got the review part built in. Access management platforms are smart enough to identify outliers where it can find where a person in your company has a level of elevated access much higher than all their peers and help highlight that to people in charge so that they can take a look at that. And these highlights don't just go to IT. They can go to the audit department inside of your organization so you have a separation so that everything's not beholden on IT to do these things. And also, the audit department can kick off what are called recertification campaigns where they're sending out emails to all the application owners and asking the application owners to confirm that that person still needs access to whatever platform they allowed and, then, and during that review, the application order can revoke the permission. All of this being done without going on to your IT team, all of this being done independent. And best of all, this access review could also be to review access of people in your IT department. Because lingered access, elevated access also happens with those people as well. Let's take a look at what this now does. What was once a ring that involved, I think it was about eight or nine steps, now becomes a four-step process. Number one, the access is submitted by the requester. The application owner, number two, approves it. Number three, somebody in audit or IT kicks off a recertification campaign. And number four, if that access is no longer required, it's revoked. This is all being done by non-technical people, all being done on, <clears throat> on an, a, a centralized platform with these sort of things built into it. And what's also good is that you can also run these sort of things on your own IT department as well. So why should you care? What does this matter? What does this have to do with security? Because this sounds more like operations than anything else. Most of the hacks that, that people talk about that you see in the news, somebody's password was cracked. One of your staff's password has been cracked. And hackers, they're going to take the path of least resistance as much as possible. So if you have, and when that happens, your best layer of defense are things like the conditional access policies that you get through identity and access management platforms and good governance and of access of your systems. If people are not, if they're given elevated access for only exactly as long as they need it, then your expose, exposure to to other people, bad actors, getting that information is only exposed for exactly as long as that person needed to do their job. If everybody's access sticks with their default stuff, then you can help manage your risk to a data exposure a lot better through good governance. Another thing to remember is don't forget about your customer portals. Access review, okay, I'll give it to you, not applicable. Uh, access request, okay, I'll give you that too. That's also not applicable. But what is, is the actual technology that people use whenever they're signing into your, your, your portals. In almost all cases in Cayman, portals are built by somebody else. It's some service that you've 
some subscription that you signed up to, you found a vendor. That vendor has everything baked in. They've got authentication already covered. Think about, and now you've, you've deployed your portal, it's off, it's doing great. You've got lots of people on it. But stop and think about what you've done. All of your users are now in someone else's database using somebody else's proprietary authentication. How are you going to move those users to, someone, to, to another platform? They don't belong to you anymore, basically. You think you're going to find a vendor that's going to make it easy for you to transition users off, off of their system? No. Now, instead, what you should be taking a look at is what's called a consumer identity and access management platform. What this allows you now is the ability to get people signed into your platform, and it creates a separation between the authentication part and the service that they're using. So an at, at end result from a, your end result is that your users will go to your portal, they'll get redirected to a sign-in page, they sign in, they get, they get taken back to your home page of your portal, and they're utilizing your service. They've got access to everything that you've wanted them to have access to. If you lend, remembering our microservices structure, right? An application is not any one thing, it's not any one server, it's not any one service. If you have a portal that does 99% of what you want, but you want to add that extra 1% of functionality through some other, maybe custom development, maybe some other, some other vendor's portal to supplement the services that you need out of the primary one, they can also use your consumer and identity access management platform. So just like in Office 365, you go to portal.office.com, you sign in. Next step, you need to get into SharePoint. You click SharePoint. That is a totally different service, platform, vendor, data center in a different geographic place in the world. But I'll bet you majority, anybody that was in this room that isn't a software developer, you probably wouldn't have known. A couple redirects happen, you're taken in. That's what's going to happen with your customers. And what it means for you as a business owner is that if you have, a, you have a portal that you're very proud of, that you've done really well on, that you've got good customer buy-in, and you want to later move to another platform that's a little bit better, that offers a little better services, or maybe the platform you're on right now have kind of ended up in the news and you want to distance yourself from that, you can now move to another platform because the vendors that you select use the technologies I've mentioned before. Open ID Connect, SAML. Write these things down. Make sure that you include it. That is something for business leaders as well. Open ID Connect, SAML. You should be asking your vendors whenever they're talking to them, do you support this? Because this is a way that you can avoid yourself getting locked in with a different developer, with a, with a, a vendor. Because I'll tell you something, if your plan is, dear customer, I've moved to a different platform, I need you to re-register, this is what you're going to get. Now, let's, let's take a break from that and let's go on to automation. Automation is going to be a key part of allowing you to better your security posture in general. You should try to do as much automation as possible. Automate your internal tasks, external provisioning, deprovisioning, and change management. And you need to make sure that you don't pick a technology stack that is dependent on any single cloud provider. You're not in a good position if you're on Azure and you're relying on all the different automation features that exist in Azure and Azure alone. What happens if you need to leave Azure? What happens if you are purchased by someone else and they're on AWS? Where is all that automation gone? Where has that gotten you? None of these companies are beholden to you, so don't be beholden to them. They're great companies, but use the technology stacks that make sense for you, spread your application out, and build up an automation uh, using frameworks that are not beholden to anyone. These are things like Ansible, Terraform, OpenShift. Don't use technology stacks that only work with a single provider. 
And as far as the other thing to consider here, and this might seem like a pretty radical idea, change management. So think about a ransomware attack. Everything's gone. You're done. You need to rebuild your environment. Everyone here thinks they already have the answer to that. Just go, back, just go to your backups. Most hacks, ransomware hacks, people don't, don't uh, set off the bomb as soon as they get through your doors. Instead, what they're doing is they leave a breadcrumb, of, a breadcrumb of, of vulnerabilities all around your network and then tackle you and then go after you at a time that makes most sense for them. And that means that those vulnerabilities might be in your backups because some hackers can be pretty patient. I've heard stories about hackers encrypting backups. So you, meanwhile, you thought Wow, okay, I'm still protected. I'm backing up my, my systems often. But when you go to restore your systems, you're then realizing your backups are encrypted and you can't utilize them. Because I, I will, Cayman's no different than anywhere else in the world. You're probably not looking at or using or checking your backups until you need to. And then even if that's not the case for you, there's always the chance that sleeping inside of that, that backup is that same vulnerability that puts you in the bad spot to begin with. So all you're, all you're doing is setting yourself up for a replay. Last but not least is that you need a secret vault. Privilege access management is something, is a buzzword that's going around Cayman. Most people have an idea of it. Uh, it's, you know, you're rotating the passwords Okay, and you're rotating the passwords on, uh, these are supposed to be icons, I noticed that using a custom font, that's not a good idea, maybe I'll go images next time. Uh, you've, you're probably rotating the password on your local server, you're rotating the passwords on your Linux environments, maybe you're doing your certificates as well, uh, your client IDs and, and client secrets, etc. Your access tokens, refresh tokens. But are you, re are you rotating the passwords on your data stores? Because that's what hackers want access to. Once, they get pa once a hacker gets past your first line of defense, they're going for your data, because that's where your money is, that's where your value is. So you should be using things to rotate the passwords on your database servers, on your FTP servers, on your file shares, et cetera, so that when your application is accessing data, from your database, it's using the latest password available that was given to that server, rather than using a common password that not only you know, but every developer that used to work for your company knows as well. So what do I do? My wife warned me that I should change that photo. I want to ask her why she says it's because he looks better than me. I told her that it doesn't help me because it doesn't matter what photo I put up there, it's probably always going to be the case. Uh, I, help, I help companies create development strategies, includes multi-cloud. I'm generally talking to people about avoiding vendor lock-in, which is what you need to do. This is what you should write down, and then automating anything and everything. These are the sort of strategies, it doesn't, if you take the what do I do part out of this slide and you just look at the bullet points, these are the things that you need, to, that I've tried and you should try to take away from this talk. It's, to help you better position your company. It doesn't matter who does it for you. These are the things that you should do that will help increase your security posture. Right? Multi-cloud, avoid vendor lock-in, automate as much as you can because that's gonna help you come back. And then, break, and then uh, you know, developing, try to your best to break down the barriers between your decision makers, infrastructure, and developers. Thank you very much for your time. Um, does anybody have any questions? Okay, well, you're not all sleeping, so that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, one question. Sure. Um, you did mention that um, you need to diversify your security practices. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance that in the business perspective in terms of security? Um, okay. um, I was asking, uh, you did say that we need to um, diversify the, our cloud strategy. Um, but how do you balance that with um, getting skill set with persons who are um, exposed to all these different um, technologies? Well, 
it's a balancing act there, right? First of all, diversifying your cloud strategy can mean using services that are common to all clouds, like object storage, yeah, blob storage. It doesn't matter what cloud it is, it all works the same, yeah? But when it comes to the examples I gave where you're saying, well, you need AI, which is a specialty of one cloud provider over another, yeah? Your introduction to that is probably going to involve a specialist, yeah? So your specialist can help you through that. But at the same time, remember that I view, and I think it would be good for you to view, I view the cloud as a stock market. It's the place that I go and I shop for the best price based on what I need. So if I have an application, a large application, and it needs artificial intelligence, SQL backend, um, I need some blob storage, and a number of other different technologies, I'm going to surf the cloud for whatever price that makes sense. And if that means spreading it across four different clouds, it doesn't matter to me because there is a commonality between these services on the different clouds. They all sell some different stuff, but you need to go to the one that specializes and the best price for whatever small service you need. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you very much. And... Uh, Take care.